My name is Winkley Phipps, and at the age of 14 and a half years old, I woke up one morning talking like this. <laughs> Messed up my father, if you can imagine your 14 year old saying, Hey, Dad. <laughs> I want to thank uh, Dean Muscala for this privilege. Uh, will you pray with me, Father? As I open your holy word, I ask that you cleanse me of all unrighteousness, fill my life with your Holy Spirit's presence and power. Speak to me through me and for me. I promise you, Lord, I'll always give you the honor, the glory, and the praise. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. I must say, I feel like that old black Baptist preacher who once said, I'm no jumbo jet preacher, but I do need a little runway. <laughs> and because I have just a few minutes of runway today, I'm going to dispense with my normal preaching cadence and try to cover as much ground as I can. I've been an Adventist pastor for 45 years. Amen. And I've been the pastor of the Palm Bay Church in Florida for the last 20 years. Now, I will be speaking to you from an American, North American context, and this will probably be a message unlike any you have ever heard before. But I know I'm speaking to adults That's right. who can handle what I'm sharing. And if I stop abruptly, it will be because I have more thoughts than time. My message is entitled, A Time of Transition for the Church I Love. A Time of Transition for the Church I Love. My scripture is taken from John chapter 21, verse 4. The Bible says, But when the morning was now come, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples knew not that it was Jesus. Then Jesus saith unto them, Children, have ye any meat? They answered him, No. And he said unto them, Cast the net on the right side of the ship, and ye shall find. They cast therefore, and now they were not able to draw it for the multitude of fishes. Our scripture tells us that seven of Christ's disciples were fishing on the Sea of Galilee. As experienced fishermen, they knew that fishing is an endeavor that requires timing, instinct, innovation, patience, and a whole lot of faith. Our scripture then tells us the disciples had fished all night long and had caught nothing. Embarrassed and frustrated, they were coming back to the shore with nothing to show for their long night of work. Children, said Jesus, have you any meat yet? Did you catch anything? They answered him, no, sir. And Jesus said unto them, if you cast your net on the right side of the ship, you'll find a lot of fish. You will achieve the success you had hoped for. The Bible says they cast their net on the right side and there were so many fish in their net, they were not able to pull it back in. As I was drawn to this passage of scripture, scripture, I believe God led me there because we who serve as ministers in ministry today, by every critical metric of ministry, we too as pastors have been toiling all night with very little to show for our efforts. We have studied hard, preached with earnestness and sincerity. We struggled and labored, but for the most part, our efforts have proven ineffective and unproductive. I've been a pastor since 1976, and I can say irrefutably, our churches are aging. The 18 to 45 demographic has been disappearing right before our very eyes. You know, when a pastor starts doing more funerals than weddings and baby blessings, that's a sign of difficult days ahead. Back in the day when my wife and I was here with me, Linda, today, we were 
When we were younger, my wife and I used to cuddle, but we still do, but back then, when we used to cuddle, we'd smell Jovan Musk and Chanel Number no. 5. Now it's icy hot and thin <laughs> day and anything with menthol in it. Menthol, menthol is the new fragrance. I want you to know when that happens, that's a sign of difficult days ahead. And frankly, the church, the church growth numbers in America spell difficult days ahead. They are grim, these church numbers, growth numbers, and they are depressing. It is estimated in the next 18 months, more than 50,000 Christian churches will go out of business in the United States of America. Almost, that's almost 100 churches a day over the next 18 months will close their doors. Now one reason is from the year 2000 to 2020, it dropped from 45% to 25% the amount of Americans who now say they are practicing Christians. And because 90% of the people we baptize into the Seventh-day Adventist Church are already practicing Christians, and because the pool of practicing Christians has been cut in half over the last 20 years, and because ostensibly we have no Bible studies for the unchurch, that means for the foreseeable future, we won't have as many new people to baptize as we did 20 or 30 years ago. In 2019, the Adventist Church in North America grew by a little over 5,000 members in North America. Now, that might not sound so bad, except for the fact that we have more than 6,000 churches and companies. That means in 2019, we were not able to grow our church in North America by even one member per church per year. And that's with all our pastors, all our buildings, all the billions we have stockpiled and squirreled away. Yes, we're a very wealthy church. All our prophecy seminars, all our levels of administrative leadership, and we have them. Still, we were not able to grow the church in North America even by one member per church per year. Now, leaders are not going to tell you that because they're there to get good news. I'm sure our 2020 COVID church growth numbers will be like the Queen of England once said of a difficult year in her life, she called it an annus horribilis. That's Latin for a horrible year. Our 2020 COVID numbers is going to be horrible. A year filled with disaster and misfortune. But I hear someone saying, well, thank God the regional, or the, that's, a, that's a, a euphemism for black. Uh, the regional black conferences in America are doing much better than that. The truth is, can I level with you? They're doing worse than that. Our regional church growth numbers are inflated and exaggerated. Frankly, it is dishonest and embarrassing. Last year, one of our brave regional conferences decided that they could no longer continue to report fictitious membership numbers. And with the help of their church clerks, this one conference took off of their membership records the names of persons they could no longer honestly account for. And when they were finished, one conference, one regional conference, adjusted their membership numbers downwards from 43,000 to 33,000. And if that is any indication of the severity of the problem, it looks like for all of our regional conferences, including my conference, the Southeastern Conference, that about 25% of the membership numbers we have on our books are made up of people we can no longer account for. Now, one of my main concerns is for the teenagers in our post-COVID churches. You know, lately in our public schools, educators find themselves grappling with what many are calling the COVID learning loss. Well, because the COVID pandemic has removed young people from their learning environments. And many of our children are a year or more behind in their education. Well, I want you to know, I believe over the past year and a half, and I can see it as a pastor, teenagers in our churches have suffered a profound COVID spiritual learning loss. 
and we're losing them. We're going to see in our teenagers deep deficits and shortfalls in their spiritual growth and maturity. And I believe we must act swiftly and with intentionality if we're going to save our youth and our young people. I believe it's time to do ministry in ways we've never done it before. It's time to cast our nets on the right side of the ship. Now the mission hasn't changed. We're still a mission-driven church. We're still fishers of men. But Jesus is trying to tell us the left side is no longer the best side to fish. Times have changed. The tide is shifting. And if we're going to be successful, we're going to have to change our approach if we want to see our nets full again. We have to change our tactics and our strategies if we want to draw our nets in filled with fish. We will have to change our plans and our schemes. And this is the tough one. I'm going to deal with this for a moment. We will have to change the structure and leadership models of our institutions. We will have to change our standards and practices and systems of operation. Yes, the right side of the ship represents new obedience and new faith. But I believe the right side of the ship is also biblical symbolism for new efforts, new methods, new creativity, new vision, new ingenuity, and new styles and models of leadership. And I believe I hear Jesus saying to us in ministry today, you can't keep doing what you've been doing and expect different results. The currents have shifted, the trends have accelerated. Instead of being a community church, we have become a commuter church. And COVID has taught us that commuters will welcome their computers as a replacement for their commute. COVID has taught us that many are perfectly fine making their voyage to church a virtual one. And that people who can be perfectly happy working from home can also be perfectly happy churching from home. I can almost hear somebody say, but Pastor, Pastor, it's not all that bad. Look, even though the membership is down, the tide is up. Are we that short-sighted that we cannot see the growing bank accounts and decreasing memberships spell catastrophe and disaster for the future? We cannot bank the principle of the third angel's message and live off the interest, it will eventually catch up with us. And besides, don't you know there was a lot of wealth on the Titanic when it went down? So Pastor, what can we do? Pastor, what should we do? I believe that COVID-19 has given us an opportunity to reimagine the church of the future. For hundreds of years, the proclamation of the gospel has been done from pulpits in church buildings. The digital revolution has been making buildings obsolete. Malls and department stores, and especially church buildings that cannot justify their reason for existing because they are only open for a few hours a week. Church buildings open for a few hours a week will have a hard time surviving when people are embracing new worship habits made possible by the digital revolution. Through the years, there were five drivers that we counted on to guarantee strong church attendance. And they were fellowship, people went to church for fellowship, for instruction, for inspiration, for the promise of transformation and service. But all of those have been digitized. 80% of our fellowship is now virtual. Think about it. 80% of the fellowship or interaction you have with other people is virtual. And come to think about it, the most transformational relationship I have in my life is a virtual one. I have a virtual relationship with Jesus. I've never seen his face. But I can sense his presence, and I can hear his voice in my heart and in my ear. 
And not only is fellowship increasingly virtual, most of our instruction is going digital and virtual as well. And today, most of our inspiration comes from our streaming and not our dreaming. The time may have come, my friends, to ask for us to ask some hard questions. What, what role should church buildings play in the dissemination of the third angel's message? Are traditional houses of worship and the buildings we have erected the most efficient platform to proclaim the gospel and present truth to most people? And is preaching to finite seats in a sanctuary still the best way to ensure the widest proclamation and witness of present truth? The time has come for us to ask ourselves, in an age and era where communication is dominated by images and video, what is the most effective role that buildings can play in a digital environment? Did you know there are more people in the United States of America today than there were on all the continents of the earth the day Jesus was born. And with almost 8 billion people on the earth, what will be the best way to achieve the widest possible communication footprint? After all, all you are training to become is a communication soldier in a war of words. Through the centuries, seminaries have been preparing ministers for what I call the last mile challenge. How do you get the words of God, the last mile, from the printed page into the hearts and minds of men and women? And because of technological breakthroughs, the last mile challenge is no longer a challenge of the printed page. For you see, the printed page is no longer the primary technology method of storing and communicating information. In America, 80% of families did not buy one book last year. And yes, <laughs> about half of all college students say they never read another book after graduation. <laughs> the printed page has become an outdated storage communication technology. Sadly, with the demise of the printed page, the physical Bible, you know the one you carry around, leather engraved with your name, underlined, the one that has gone away. The scripture, when you say to young people today, a modern mind turns to the scripture, it's swiping, clicking and launching. Now, the Word of God has not gone away, but the physical Bible on printed pages has gone away. And today, it is reading the scriptures on a mobile device. Not long ago, I said, Alexa, read me Galatians 1.16. <laughs> read me the story of David and Goliath. Did you know that today, more children are likely to own a phone than to own a book? Did you know that children, 12 to 24, spend 5 to 10 minutes a day reading from a printed page and 3 to 6 hours a day watching images and video on a smartphone, tablet, or computer screen? As a result, their minds have been completely rewired. Before they can eat, speak, or walk on their own, images and video have become their first language and their core language. And we have come to a point with images and video are a more powerful communication tool to the modern mind than the spoken word preaches or the written word. You take Abraham Lincoln's Gettysburg Address. You've probably never seen it. Or, and take Dr. King's I Had a Dream speech. Dr. King's speech will resonate for generations precisely because it was caught on video. Every time, if you had to go to a book every time you wanted to experience Dr. King's speech, it would never have the impact it continues to have today. And if you're still not sure, you understand what I'm saying. Get the most eloquent speaker alive, the most prolific writer alive, to write an article or deliver a sermon or a message 
on what happened to George Floyd on that corner in Minneapolis. It would have never had the revolutionary impact of those eight minutes and 48 seconds of video. To the modern mind of the young mind, images and video are a more powerful communication tool than the spoken word or the written word. As a consequence, I believe the preaching and teaching of the future will have to be very different than the teaching and preaching of the past. Our proclamation of the word will increasingly be more image and video driven. Think of it, think of it. If we have no church buildings anywhere, and we have to start from scratch today to reach eight billion people, would raising up church buildings from the union revolving fund be the way to go? And when people ask me, is digital the future? Can we really have koinonia, discipleship, and mentoring outside of physical spaces? I tell them, for me, it is not an either or proposition. For me, it has to be both and. To see a more successful future, we need the Holy Spirit to guide us and help us build what I call a spiritually balanced, synergistic hybrid between buildings and media technology. I also believe there will always be a need for a common house, a separate location, a holy space set apart for a holy purpose. Church buildings, however, have their limitations as a primary communication strategy. We need to pioneer digital platforms and tools that can reach people anywhere and everywhere. Now friends, our problem is we are rich in message but we are very poor in skills to market our message. I believe we are at an infection point and we're going to have to reimagine everything about church and worship. We have, we have to reimagine what preaching and teaching can look like for the future. Should the Lord tarry 15 years from now, do you think your children or grandchildren will still be listening to men and women pacing behind plexiglass pulpits, sweating and shouting for an hour? Is that really the worship experience you expect will keep your children and grandchildren in the church? In Isaiah 43, God says, Remember not the former things, nor consider the things of old. Behold, I am doing a new thing. One writer said, If you persist in holding too tightly to the greatness of what God has done in the past, you will miss the greatness of what God is going to do in the future. I believe it's time to cast our nets on the right side of the ship and reimagine the worship experience, church attendance, and even the on-ramps to church membership and attendance. If we're going to succeed, I believe we're also going to have to reimagine, this is where I, I, I don't have enough time, but this is going to be tough. We have to reimagine what church administration and church leadership models should look like. Now, what I'm about to say for the next few moments may be difficult for some to take, but I believe someone has to say it, so I'm going to say it. The leadership models and the leadership styles we are using to run our churches, organizations, and administrations today are outmoded, outdated, and obsolete. And they are one of the reasons, listen carefully, they are one of the reasons we are not growing and showing progress as a church. And what do I mean? And I say this kindly, the leadership model and the leadership culture of our church is actually hampering, hindering, and stymieing our growth as a church. You see, God has shown me that even though we have always had to subdue authoritarian impulses in the church, the ministry leadership culture we have today, in large part, has come from borrowing from a post-World War II military culture. And the military culture is a culture of control. The control of resources, the control of threats, the control of personnel. And this, in this military ministerial culture, most pastors feel like they're in the military. And they learn that holding the fort is safer than taking new territory and fighting something new. In this military ministerial culture, pastors figure out that marking time and doing the same thing year after year is what is expected, even if there is no progress. Now what I'm saying may not apply to where you come from. But it certainly does apply to some conferences and conference presidents. I've been in this ministry over about 50 years, I can tell you. We have a ministerial, can I, can I be real in the next five minutes? Yes. 
We have a ministerial military culture built on leadership by fear and intimidation. Yes. Listen, listen, listen. In 1995, I was voted into the General Conference. My first meeting was in Rio de Janeiro. We were having a big conference to plan. I was in the Public Affairs Religious Liberty Department. I'm getting on the elevator in the hotel. One of the longtime lawyers in that department got on the elevator with me, just he and I together, saying, hey, how you doing? And he turned to me as the elevator started to move. He says, I'm going to do everything in my power to get you out of your position. I said, you might, try to hurt, you might hurt my family. So I'm, trying, I'm not trying to hurt your family, but I'm going to do everything in my power to get you out. I want you to know, we have a ministry, leadership, culture, often built on intimidation and fear. Yes. Be very clear, with a theology degree from this seminary, my alma mater, you have very few career options. And because of that, most pastors will tell you they then live in fear of their executive administrator of their conference. Now, I know you're adults and you can handle this straight talk. Can you handle this straight talk? A conference executive is the one man in the chain of conference leadership who can determine your wife's career trajectory. She may be rising where she is, but he can determine your wife's career trajectory. He can determine your children's quality of education yes. by sending you to a city that has a good school or no school. Yes. He's the one who can unjustly disrupt your life and you have no institutional or legal recourse. In this ministerial military culture, you follow orders blindly. You only do what you're given sanction and clearance to do. As an old preacher once said to me, remember son, it's not a call from God unless the committee votes it. Oh, this, kind, this kind of culture, this kind of culture, yes, and this, 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 this is connected to why we're not growing. Listen, because this kind of culture puts a damper on the creative thinking yes, sir. that is needed to advance the kingdom of God. If we're going to cast our nets on the right side of the ship, we're going to have to imagine doing church leadership differently. Amen. Now, I'm sure, like me and most other pastors, and, and some of you, all we wanted to be was good soldiers. Yes, and it's one thing a good soldier learns, it's duty above everything else. Duty above self, often duty above family, mm. and definitely duty above creativity. What? Did you say, Pastor? Duty above creativity? What do you mean? You see, good soldiers in a military culture don't invent and create new weapons with which to fight. Good soldiers in a military culture, you fight with the weapons you are given, even if they are outdated. And I believe to cast our nets on the right side of the ship, we will have to embrace a collaborative, spiritual, synergistic leadership model where pastors and laity help to modernize and construct new weapons and strategies for the battles we now must fight. To cast our nets on the right side of the ship, we need to embrace a collaborative spiritual leadership model that allows visioning and creativity to flow from the ministry. We need new kinds of ministers too. I hope you get your MM degree while you're here. Never heard of that. We need marketing ministers. We need messaging ministers. We need media ministers who are trained experts in these disciplines, not hobbyists, but experts who understand that content is king, but distribution is emperor. Participation in creation ensures implementation. One more thing, in this military ministerial culture, it's the generals who are celebrated when the victories are won. You know, the Patton's, the MacArthur's, the Eisenhower's, it's the generals who are celebrated more than the soldiers. I believe generals must celebrate the soldiers. 
and the generals must be secure enough, ego-free, secure enough to celebrate that God may have new generals in the making in their midst. We have two many insecure generals in this military ministry of culture, and they can be found. stars in my conference. I'm about building constellations. Insecure generals only want soldiers to get visibility when they promote them. I once served under a secure general by the name of Herb Brecker. He was the president of the Potomac Conference. He said to me one time, don't worry about what they're saying. As long as a star shines for Jesus, that's all right. Good I got so much more to give you, but I gotta quit. We need a new model where leaders who lead with humility consult their pastors and their church members before they make decisions even on the best fit for a ministerial assignment. <laughs> because here, look at what God gave me. You go to 83. When leaders consult with humility, you have less political outcomes and more spiritual outcomes. Now, I don't have time to give you what I see as my way forward. But I want you to go to 100 if you can quickly. Here's what the servant of the Lord says. She says, God will guide his messengers in the adoption of new men to arrest the attention of men and convince their judgment. He will give skills and understanding and the use of effective illustrations to arrest the attention of the people. New methods must be introduced. God's people must awaken to the necessity of the time in which they are living. And they will seek for what? New methods. And ways by which to develop character and educate you how to use the talents God has given them. And finally, progress will be made from generation to generation in order to preserve in the world a knowledge of the true God, of his laws and commandments. Progress will be made from generation to generation. And so I'm asking you, will you pray with me? Father, this is a time of transition for the church we love. We need your help as we cast our nets on the right side of the ship. Lord, we know we can and must do something about our situation and circumstance. We know that you can bless, bless a poor plan. What you cannot bless is no plan. Please, Lord, help us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen. I was going to sing a song, but I'm so sorry. <laughs> By the way, while I'm here this week, I'm going to be here all week. And I look forward, and if any of you want to meet, I want to meet with anybody who wants to explore how we could use a revolutionary tool that I have just built to present the gospel using technology. You just check with the dean's office.
Bye. 